how do you navigate a career in infectious diseases and biomedical science without the federal government? The science, the technology, the opportunities for innovation have never been greater, yeah. but we're going to have to recognize that, we're, that a lot of this is going to happen outside U.S. government support. From vaccine skepticism to funding cuts, health workers are facing a decisive moment in history. Now more than ever, infectious disease experts need to stand up for science. Joining us now in the ID Week TV studio is Dr. Peter Hotez, vaccinologist, pediatrician, and science advocate. Peter, thank you so much for your time today. Great to see you, Veronica. Good to see you. So let's go ahead and just state the obvious, which is this anti-vaccine rhetoric that has been spreading through the current administration. Where do you believe it's coming from? Do you believe that our leaders have been misled? Is this rhetoric being spread intentionally? Well, I think it's helpful to understand how this anti-vaccine movement has evolved. You know, we call it misinformation or infodemic, like just some random junk out there on the internet. And it's not, it's organized, it's deliberate, it's politically motivated and it has financial underpinning. And if you remember the initial assertion against vaccines mm -hmm. was that vaccines cause autism. And it was a, maybe a decade ago when the NIH asked me to speak to Bobby Kennedy and had a year of conversations with him trying to explain why vaccines, the evidence showing vaccines don't cause autism uh, and the lack of plausibility because of the role of autism genes in early fetal brain development. But it's really important to understand how what started out solely around vaccines and autism morphed and changed. So about a decade ago, it took on this political mantle of health freedom, medical freedom, um, and anti-vaccine groups started getting PAC money, political action committee mm -hmm. money. And now superimposed on those two um, are uh, the health and wellness and influencer. Uh, industry mm -hmm. um, that buys up what it can in bulk and jacks up the price and charges 1600 telehealth dollars for telehealth visits. And if you ever wondered why they're all anti-parasitic drugs, ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine, because mm -hmm. it's available in abundance, it's cheap, it's generic. You can then buy it, um, repackage it, and then build customers with a telehealth business. So it's it's a it's a multi-million, probably multi-billion dollar uh, industry. Uh, as, as a consequence. And, and you can watch how Mr. Kennedy's rhetoric has changed to align himself with the wellness and influencer industry. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, you, you know, this is where during our terrible measles epidemic uh, in, in West Texas, you know, you heard Mr. Kennedy, well, yes, you can get the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, or you can get this cocktail of supplements, vitamin A, budesonide, and clarithromycin. And you're like, where the heck does that come from? Well, the answer is the wellness and influencer industry. This is what Maha is. So uh, unfortunately, to push the snake oil, what Maha has to do also, or feels they have to do, is not only promote the interests of the wellness and influencers, but at the same time, tear down the um, mainstream biomedical sciences. And this is where you're seeing this very damaging rhetoric being directed at the medical schools, the academic health centers, trying to claim they're nothing more than PR reps for pharma companies um, and, you know, cuts to the NIH and then vilifying, you know, hardworking biomedical scientists and portraying them as public enemies or cartoon villains. So it's created this very dark space, uh, unfortunately, in this current administration. I have so many questions for you right now. Now, but let's go ahead and, and state the obvious, which is how do you combat the misinformation? Well, I think it's 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 tough because um, it does have uh, political support. It has a lot of financial support and it's starting to dominate the Internet. It's starting to dominate uh, the cable news channels, the podcast. So it's become this whole uh, anti-science uh, ecosystem is so uh, overarching and so complicated. Um, a lot of it is being pushed by the Murdoch media empire and Fox News. And this is documented by two groups, Media Matters for America, a watchdog group and a research group out of, out of the Federal University of Science and Technology in Switzerland. They documented, for instance, during the Delta wave, you know, when Americans should have been getting vaccinated, how every night Tucker Carlson, Laura Ingram, Sean Hannity filled their broadcast three million viewers a night um, with uh, misinformation about vaccines. So what happened there is very interesting in their zeal to push back against vaccine mandates, which I didn't agree with, but I understood it, you know, the libertarian philosophy. They unfortunately went the next measure and brought on all these toxic talking heads to falsely discredit the effectiveness and safety 
of vaccines. So if you're watching Fox News every night or watching Joe Rogan podcast and all of his rhetoric about ivermectin, you sort of went down that that rabbit hole and um, and uh, sometimes you paid for it with your life by making a catastrophic decision to not take a, a COVID vaccine. And, and again, this is why we have to care about it because it's not just some sort of arcane or academic discussion. So what do you think it's gonna take then? I think, you know, working through the healthcare providers, people still, for the most part, I still think trust their pediatrician and internist, although that confidence uh, is eroding. So I think that's important. We need to have our academic physicians, scientists, our infectious disease experts out there explaining this because I think too often we're invisible. And when you're invisible, that allows the bad actors to portray you uh, as they wish, as sort of nefarious figures in white coats plotting all sorts of, of, of terrible things. So I think that's part of the answer also. Well, I know during the pandemic you gained notoriety for your use of social media. You were talking about COVID and the vaccines on social media. Do you believe that social media is a useful tool or has it become too much of a liability? One of the things that's interesting is when um, young people, you know, say, um, you know, I'd like to be get involved in public engagement, you know, sort of like you. And the first thing they ask me is about social media. And one of the things that I explained to them actually is probably social media is the least rewarding and I think maybe least impactful aspect of, of public engagement. You know, people think that's where you go first, but in fact, it's at the bottom of my list. I, I follow the tenets of Lady Gaga, who once called social media the toilet of the internet. And, and, I, and I think there's, there's some uh, uh, evidence for that. So, um, so I do it, I am on social media for legacy reasons, but I, I don't, see it as being very impactful anymore. So the answer is what then? Well, one of the most meaningful thing I do in terms of public engagement are my single author books, or in this case, a co-authored book now with, with Michael Mann, because I think you can say things in a long format and it does have an effect on people. Um, but then, you know, I do write a lot of opinion pieces, both for biomedical journals, as well as, um, uh, as well as um, you know, public uh, newspapers and uh, and that sort of thing. I also try to put a lot of information out there and give lectures for other physicians because I think one of the problems that we're facing now is the physicians don't, especially if you're not thinking about vaccines and you know, reading all the journals on a daily basis as an internist or a pediatrician or obstetrician can't do in a, in a busy practice, they don't have the talking points. So what's happening is the physician, the, the patients or the parents of the patients are coming in after downloading this stuff on the internet and they're made to feel like, make the, the pediatrician or the internist feel like they're not keeping up with the literature. Well, they are, they're just not keeping up with the crazy stuff. The anti-vaccine messages and the rhetoric is becoming increasingly sophisticated in a, in a diabolical sense in that they're using more and more science terms that sound right, but it's, it's all made up. And, but again, the physician needs those talking points to be able to say, well, here's why this, this isn't true. And I think that would be helpful as well. So maybe it all comes down to messaging at the end of the day. Doctor, I wanted to ask you in the face of all of this anti-vaccine rhetoric and the pushback and the budget cuts, do you remain optimistic for the future? I, I try to. Um, well, first of all, one of the things that I, that I try to say is be careful of the rhetoric that says, oh, just hunker down for a couple of years. This is going to go back to the way it was. And I don't think that's true. I think we're in a different country. And, and so it, it's not a matter of hunkering down. It's leaning in, but in, in finding productive ways. So that's, that's point one. Uh, I think um, second, recognize that the government cuts to biomedical science cuts to the NIH will be real, will be substantial. There will also, there's also, you know, the other thing, just, just the cuts, they're kind of waging psychological warfare on our young scientists and physician scientists because they're not saying what they're going to cut or when. So there's this kind of arbitrariness uh, in terms of, of what they're doing. So um, wh how do you navigate a career in infectious diseases and biomedical science without the federal government? Um, and that's, that's much tougher. I think um, looking more to the private sector, I think bio, you know, a greater role for biotech, 
I think having more fluidity between the biotech sector and the academic um, health centers. One way to do this is I could imagine the uh, professor of infectious diseases of the future might have one hand in biotech, a foot in an academic, either laboratory or clinical research enterprise, maybe working with management consultants like a McKinsey or BCG, maybe working with venture capital, maybe working even all the private equity that's going in. So getting used to the fluidity in, in that space, I think is you know one way to do that, but it's going to involve um, a culture change uh, uh, to make that happen. And I think also physicians, physician scientists will need to become more entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. get more involved in healthcare technology, um, startups, um, uh, all of the AI and innovation that's coming out now is, is really impressive. So there's a, the science, the technology, the opportunities for innovation have never been greater, yeah. but we're going to have to recognize that we're a, that a lot of this is going to happen outside U.S. government support. Times are changing in more yeah. ways than yeah, one, absolutely. aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Hotez, thank you so much for your time. Thank it's you, been Veronica. an absolute pleasure to sit down and spend some time with you today. Thank you.